Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today, finally talking about a high conviction play of mine that has been that way for a while. We're going to talk about Texas Pacific Land Corp. Uh, it's a heavy weighting in almost all almost all of my portfolios. So disclaimer, nothing I say here is advice. It's just me uh, documenting my opinions with the world. If you go back and have a look, then you might find it interesting as to how some of my calls have turned out over time. So that's it. Uh, if you want a more detailed uh, deep dive valuations, uh, equity research, and my thoughts on the world uh, as it pertains to investments, you can join the ROI Club uh, on my Substack. Link in the description. Heaps of free content. Um, lots of multi baggers in there, um, and I think you will enjoy um, my writings. So, Texas Pacific uh, Land Corporation. Immediately, people will look at this and I go, "Oh, the share price is too high. This is uh, the wrong way to look at it." Today, I'm going to give you my overview. What's important about this? Well, uh, the stock price has um, taken off recently for a few things. Obviously, the company is doing super well, but it's done that way for ages and ages because it has a superior business model. And I'm going to sh um, give you an insight into why that's the case. Recently, they had uh, court proceedings um, finalized between uh, a certain board member and some of the others. There was a dispute as to whether the... Um, the restructuring from a trust to the corporation was the right thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. It's all been resolved. And uh, here we are today. The stock price has reflected that nicely. Ignore the number on the stock price, okay? Instead, look at the overall enterprise value and the overall um, market cap. The overall enterprise value is what you're paying for the entire business. And if you were to buy it out privately today, and market cap is what the market's bidding it for, okay? So that takes into account the balance sheet and you know, the cash or the net debt they have. That's the discrepancy there. You need to look at this little column here, the efficiency of this business model. Gross margins, EBIT margins uh, speak for themselves. So we've got that also reflected in a long, uh, long term. So last 12 months return on equity and return on invested capital. If you go back over the last like decades, you'll find it has a very, very attractive return on investment capital because of the operating model of the business. I'm going to quote Charlie Munger again. He said, in a sustainable, predictable business, your long-term return on investment is likely very near or equal to the long-term um, return on invested capital. So every dollar this company generates, you can see how much goes through to the bottom line or close enough to EBIT. That's close enough to the bottom line in this case because it's essentially a royalty business. There aren't too many expenses further down the expense column. And you can see how much of that, because there's nothing left to spend and there's no debt to service, this company just keeps continuing to uh, compound capital. And I believe with the tailwinds um, that this company has on offer, oil royalties, but particularly the water handling, data centers coming in uh, using the, this particular geographic region, needing a large amount uh, of water and infrastructure, easement fees, these are fixed fees that are going to be pumping in um, every single year. They're growing like uh, wildfire and it's just dropping straight to the bottom line. What do you do with it? We well, got no debt. Uh, there's nothing else you're going to do. You're not going to go and acquire. So you might acquire some acreage. Most likely you're going to do buybacks and that's where you're just going to see the this thing uh, seriously take off. Um, where well, you've already seen 26% um, compounded annual price performance since uh, 20, 2004. I think this thing goes back. So it's obviously done a, an amazing job and I see no reason as to why it won't continue. Exact summary, I won't read it, but it's got a very interesting history. Uh, it was a railroad and then that got dissolved. It was, I think it was going to take uh, all the way through to California, like uh, transverse Texas and, and bring rail to California. I don't believe it ever happened, got disbanded anyway. And it got granted some land in sort of half had said fashion uh, across Texas. Uh, so there you go. As of a couple of years ago, when it's, it's finalizing its surface acres, it's got 880,000 worth of surface acres that it controls. Unlike Landbridge, which is um, my favorite company, uh, at least right now, it holds the surface rights in some areas and it also holds the mineral rights, everything underneath that, the actual land itself. Um, which is a truly, truly enviable uh, position in which to find yourself, okay? It is a compounding machine who will benefit in basically any macro environment. And of course, it's an inflation beneficiary, capital light, uh, high return on investor capital business. So 
revenue streams, okay? Oil and gas royalties. So they'll contract the uh, Exxons and the whoever's of the world, the Devons, to work on their land for in exchange for royalty fees and lease fees and lots and lots of fees. Everyone gets a fee in Texas and Pacific. Water sales. So water and some resource sales that they sell to the operators operating on their lands, not to be confused with water handling and transportation. That's the big one. So your surface leases and easements. Easement is my new favorite word in terms of, um, of finance. It's a truly beautiful thing. This is where they are generating income from basically any activity that's traversing their land or the surface acres in which they control. Pipelines bringing water to. So the sourced water to the wells to frack. The produced water that comes out from the well, so the water cut, you bring up a, bar a barrel of oil and you get somewhere from three to five barrels worth of oil. It's non-potable. you got to do something with it. So you, they take it and they process it onto land that Texas Pacific owns and they get, what do you know, they get paid a fee for that. Fee for power lines, fee for roads, fees, 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 fees. Everyone gets a fee in Texas Pacific. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. They're longer term contracts, normally inflation uh, resistance because they've got embedded uh, upward adjustments every year. And it's just something that is has fascinated me and has been on my mind for so long now. So here you can see a bit of an overview and you can see the percentage of the revenues. And this is taken from the presentation. So you don't even need to dig into the SEC files for the, the, the 10Q. You can go and you can look at what do they earn from the royalties of oil and gas, surface lease and easement, water sales, and then the produced water royalties. And that is, if you see that upwards and to the right growth, they will, you know, I would expect that to be rivaling the oil and gas royalties over the next few years. So you can see the kind of runway that that, that alone can earn. All right, I've spoken a little bit about it. Um, I'm just breaking down the unit economics here. So what... It used to be like a cent per barrel and it just, the, the cost to process these barrels of, of water just continues to go up and up and up. And so that's another way. Um, you've got a call option on volume. You've got a call option on price for this thing. It's, it's truly beautiful. Oil and gas production. Okay, so they get royalties on that. That's pretty straightforward. You get the water that's produced from that process. It's a little hard to work out the economics. It's different in different areas of the world and what have, what have you, but the prices can be quoted in the 10 Q, so that's pretty easy. The daily injection rate across the ACA, um, a base that on average well completion time for the area, this is not um, hard arithmetic by any any means, but it'll give you an idea as to how the big picture works. And later we can start to, to flesh out the numbers more granular, really. If you've got 10 and a half barrels, per acre per day, let's call it 365 days, that's X barrels per year of produced water that they got to handle. Then you get the fee on those barrels. So somewhere around 385 per acre, some of the land, can you buy it for 500 an acre? Can you buy it for a thousand? Honestly, it is, uh, it is extremely variable across Texas. It's a whole new, it's a whole new thing. And um, we'll go into that another time perhaps. But your, your revenue per acre across the whole or surface acre across the whole company sits at 694, okay? Uh, if you do this math and apply it to Landbridge and how many surface acres they hold, how much revenue that will be per year, and then you compare it to Landbridge's current market cap, you can see why I'm so bullish on the thing. But anyway, that's another story. You can do that homework. Per well, you, for, per well completion, I'm told from what I, from what I can find, on average, you use up about 95,000 um, barrels there of water. That's what I'm told. Uh, I, could, I could be wrong on that one. So take it with a grain of salt. If we look at the operating um, summary quarter on quarter over the last um, 12 months, you can look at where the growth is and where the majority of the uh, revenues are being earned. And you can see when all you're doing is running a couple of employees, leasing out land, and then and letting the operations be taken care of by the the operator the EMP company it's just a truly it's just a truly wonderful business it's capital light and you'll see this reflected here in these ca free cash margins 65 cents on every dollar that they're, they're earning is going towards free cash flow and what are they going to do with it they've got no more debt and if they find some cheap acreage they can buy that up that'll be wonderful they'll continue the operations 
and or they can dish out divvies and and buy back stock. It's a it's a truly wonderful, truly wonderful thing. And you can see the cash balance growing in this line here, where my cursor is, quarter on quarter on quarter on quarter on quarter. Um, heaven help us if they if they can land a data center on one of their lands, or if they can even have a data center near their land and have a uh, have water piping transversing their lands they'll get easement fees on that which will be truly wonderful and it's it's a it's a very exciting thing they've got a ton of um, different minerals and oil underneath their land that i think will be providing for centuries depending on how long we're using oil there could be another century worth of, um, of hydrocarbon usage there It'd be interesting to see so this is a beautiful thing why is it beautiful if you look at the blue and the darker blue lines here okay revenues and your operating um, cash, okay? cash from operations. If you look at the little orange bar here, you'll see it has not moved. That's the share count outstanding. So the original owners just keep getting paid again and again and again and again and again and again in a truly compounding fashion uh, with a high return on their invested capital. Okay. I know you guys are going to say, well, what's the valuation? What's the price target? I have no real price target on this thing. Valuation, I think, is a fool's errand because, at least in this case, just because yeah, when's the terminal rate? When's this thing going to stop finding new ways to have their revenues? They've got CPI adjusted in a lot of their contracts. They've got they've got at least maybe a century worth of um, of minerals there. Water is going to be passing through their lands for as long as there's people living there, presumably. So why would you have a terminal rate on this thing? Why, you know, why won't this thing be making real inflation adjusted profits in 50 years time? I think it will be. So with that being said, I'm going to humor you anyway. And this is the thought exercise. So, we're here, what's the sort of mean multiple would you pay for this sort of thing? Throw a number on there. If it's going to continue to, to go for 50 years, I mean, what might sound like a crazy multiple, like 25, 30, 20, it sounds a little crazy. Uh, not so crazy for other royalty companies, but it might even be considered conservative if we come back to this in 20, 30, 40 years time. No debt, no expenses, and there's no capital expenses required to continue to generate the revenue. I can't stress that enough. Anyhow, our EBITDA estimates um, for 2024, you can agree with it or you can disagree with it. Free cash flow uh, was done in uh, another um, slide that I won't bore you with. But the point here is these are the numbers. These are the growth rates that I've applied. If they look aggressive to you, I think they're conservative because uh, in the base case, they're actually more conservative than what they did over the last 20 years. And that was before the the monetary policy and, and with a much lower m2 so i think it's um, i think it's conservative which is kind of crazy 10 percent discount rate that's too much weighted average cost of capital is about seven but we'll be we'll just be generous and go with it, it it's got no debt okay so it pick a number i'm going to say we're going to look for a 10 percent discount rate the probability scenarios for the base case the bull case and the bear case and divided by the current shares outstanding. Remember, if they decrease that share count again and again, this thing is just going to, um, in terms of earnings per share, just go through the roof. So it's suggesting a fair value based on the EBITDA method of around about, get rid of this silly thing, uh, 1692 versus roughly just over a thousand today. Free cash using a different method. And if you average the two, 1130 um, again, I think it's I think it's extremely conservative for this um, for this particular company, um, but you're going to have to have a longer term vision in mind. This is a compounder; it's not a trade. It's not going to get a um, it's not going to be remarked up or anything like that. It's going to be a long term vehicle for return on capital deployed because it doesn't have to deploy much capital, but it will receive a lot uh, year on year. So that's that. Return on capital, return on equity. Can't stress it enough. This is over the last 20 years. I mean, look at those numbers. If you if you had a bank account that would give you 75% interest, okay, uh, every year, I mean, you wouldn't bother looking at anything else, right? You wouldn't try and discount that or get, or get fancy with the spreadsheet. You'd say, holy shit, uh, I'm going to put 
a significant amount of my uh, investment capital towards this. And that's that, basically. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, so I'm long Texas Pacific, as you would already have known if you've been following me for a while. Um, it's a very, very heavy weighting. I'll accumulate and I'll I'll hold or continue to accumulate if there's a stock market crash and I get to buy more at a lower price. Uh, I personally absolutely will be. You guys have got to do your own due diligence. The only question I would have about buying more Texas Pacific would be, well, why wouldn't I buy some Landbridge instead? So they're very, very, very similar businesses. Arguably, Landbridge has the advantage of being uh, newer so it can learn from Texas Pacific and it has... It has a lower valuation. So potentially over time, I see Landbridge as a Texas Pacific 2.0 with the distinction that Landbridge doesn't have the mineral acres that Texas does. So that may become more important um, as the years roll on, uh, but certainly um, very, very similar businesses. And uh, I love them both. That's it. Hope you enjoy. Take care. And I'll catch you in another episode. Um, make sure you check out the Torrey Portfolio and the Substack. That's it, guys. Take care.